All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Amalia Weber. I'm the program specialist at the Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's program, Improving Water Quality Begins in Your Backyard with Kaylee Snotty. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, tonight's program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on the RHPL website shortly after. We ask the audience members please silence or turn off their cell phones before we begin in order to avoid any disturbances during the presentation. Next, the Friends of the RHPL 7th Annual Wine, Wit, and Wisdom Fundraiser is taking place here at the library on Saturday, April 30th from 6.30 to 10 p.m. Participants can attend two speaker presentations from a choice of six and enjoy a buffet dinner, drinks, a silent auction, and a 50-50 raffle. Registration forms are available at the circulation desk or you can visit rhpl.org friends for more information. Registration closes on April 25th. Our next program is What Food Labels Actually Tell Us, How to Be an Informed Eater, which will be an in-person event Thursday, April 21st at 7 p.m. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. And now to say a few words about our presentation, please welcome Marilyn Trent. Um, hi, um, for those of you who know me, I'm Marilyn Trent, the founder of Rochester Pollinators. And I did begin my journey um, when I realized that the monarch, when I learned that the monarch butterfly was in decline by up to 90%. And I have learned so much since then, and which led me to, well, back to, I knew of the Clinton River watershed, but I didn't know the interconnectedness of the um, trees and native trees and plants and shrubs and how these plants can clean the water before it goes into the storm drains. And I didn't know that that was our biggest pollutant of our rivers and streams. I am. And one more thing. And 45% of the um, Michiganders, and I'm one and we all are, uh, get our storm, uh, get our water from groundwater. So the quality matters. But the most important thing was that is it we do have some control over it in our own yards. And so that is where I um, ask uh, Kay, Katie Yates, but also Kaylee Snotty, to come and tell us more. Because I did hear one of their presentations at North Oakland Wild Ones, and I was just fascinated. I thought, how did I get this old? And I didn't know this. But I, that's what makes me want to share this and then bring in the experts. So welcome, Kaylee. Thank you so much uh, for doing this, and um, I appreciate it. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you. All right. Let me make sure I'm, I'm speaking into this correctly. All right. So my name's Kaylee Snotty. I'm with the Clinton River Watershed Council. I am their Director of Education and Stewardship. And today I'm here to talk to you guys about nature-based solutions to handling stormwater. So this presentation has a couple parts. I'm going to introduce you guys to the Clinton River Watershed Council. Um, we're going to briefly touch on what is a watershed. I'm sure all of you have some idea, but in case you need a refresher, we're going to talk a little bit about the Clinton River Watershed, and then we're going to get into what stormwater is, the problems it creates, and then we're going to talk about improving water quality with native plants and how you guys can get involved with that. So without further ado, the Clinton River Watershed Council story begins 50 years ago in the 1970s. These are some pictures of the Clinton River as it was back then. You guys can see on the right here, we've got more than one car chassis hanging out on the bank of the river there because at that time, people kind of treated the Clinton River as a dumping ground. There wasn't really any proper regulations or any kind of authority for these resources. So people, whatever they didn't want to look at anymore, it would go into the river. The Watershed Council itself began in 1972 as an association of local governments and wastewater treatment plants and concerned citizens. Um, the, the, the real catalyst to the foundation of the council was actually that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was looking to channelize part of the Clinton River to have a more direct drainage into Lake St. Clair. And the people of the watershed said, no, we don't want that. And so the Watershed Council was born. 
So today we're a small nonprofit dedicated to protecting, enhancing, and celebrating the Clinton River, its watershed, and Lake St. Clair. And we are funded by grants, individual memberships, community memberships, and donations and contributions. And our main program areas are education, doing public education programs such as these, um, our stewardship programs, which involves local cleanups. Uh, we head around the watershed um, cleaning up local parks and green spaces. We also have initiatives that happen annually, like our trash runs, where we get people in canoes out on the river to pick up trash right from the stream bed itself and watershed management. So we work with local municipalities to manage our resources, and we actually do a lot of um, data collection throughout the watershed to check the health of the river, so to speak. So our watershed, what is a watershed? In case anybody needs a refresher, a watershed is an area of land that drains into a common body of water. So the one that we're standing in right now is the Clinton River watershed. You guys can see the rain falling on this divide here. You see in red, every raindrop that falls here drains into this river. And where we are, it is the Clinton River. So here's a picture of our watershed. We're comprised of five counties, which is most of Oakland County, Macomb County, and then parts of Lapeer, St. Clair, and Wayne County. We serve 63 communities that are directly within our watershed's boundaries, and then we also serve 12 additional communities that have Lake St. Clair direct drainage. That's part of the Anchor Bay watershed in Macomb County, and then down in Wayne at the bottom here. We are 760 square miles, so that's a lot of land to fit 1.5 million people inside. The river itself is 81.5 miles. That stretches from the headwaters up in Independence Township all the way out where it empties into Lake St. Clair. Some highlights of our watershed in particular is that it's a popu popular fishery for anglers. Um, Paint Creek over on the west side I'll point it out over here. It's what runs right behind the library here. It's one of the few remaining cold water trout streams in southeast Michigan, and Lake St. Clair has popular bass fishing tournaments every single year. We have a diverse population of native flora and fauna, and we are a destination for river recreation. We're a state-designated water trail. And you guys, if anybody's interested in paddling, we actually have those maps all up on our website um, from the navigable waters starting in Oakland County all the way out into Lake St. Clair, as well as a map of the Lake St. Clair coastline. We're home to numerous parks and trails, including the Paint Creek Trail and the Clinton River Trail. And we have dozens of restoration and remediation projects, improving habitat and water quality all across the state, funded by the government and funded by local um, members and donors. So a little bit about the historical water quality problems of the Clinton River watershed. I think of these categories as being divided into two different areas. The, the ones that start off here was primarily born of a lack of policy of, and regulation. So in ecology, we have this concept called the tragedy of the commons, and that's explaining um, this uh, phenomenon where you have a commonly shared resource that nobody owns, and therefore you have this tragedy of everybody using it up and degrading it, and over time it becomes um, not as high quality as it was initially. So because water, back before we had um, regulation and policy surrounding it, people were allowed to dump whatever they wanted, be it industrial waste, the stuff that you guys saw in those pictures earlier, to, to car chassis and what have you, um, all the way to contaminated sediments. So that was a historical problem. In addition to that, we saw a pretty big boom of development when this area was first settled, going way, way back in time to the Pleistocene era when the icebergs were receding away and they were carving out Lake St. Clair. The coastline of Lake St. Clair used to expand all the way over to Sterling Heights. And then over time, it sort of gradually came back and receded to where we see Lake St. Clair today. But as it receded back, we saw lots of wetlands pop up. The entire um, east coast there, right along that Macomb side of the Lake St. Clair shoreline, used to all be wetlands. And when people came in and settled places like Mount Clemens and the entire um, Lake St. Clair communities, um, we saw a drastic change in that ecology. So we saw wetlands being filled in with concrete. People needed places to live and places to work, and they needed roads to get to where they needed to be. So we saw a, a drastic change. 
that in addition and in addition to that, we saw shoreline hardening. So if you drive alongside Lake St. Clair's coast today, a lot of it is going to be hardened seawall. You're, you're not really going to see any kind of natural trees or shrubs or anything that used to reside along the coastline there. It's all people's houses, which it's convenient for canals and marinas, but it's not so convenient for our natural resources. So moving forward in time was the Clean Water Act of 1972. So this was administered by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and now we have regulation of the discharges of pollutants into the waters of the United States. You need a permit to do so. And this upholds water quality standards for our surface waters and it increases the accountability for polluters. So now if you want to discharge anything into the surface waters of the United States, you need to monitor that. You need to keep track of what it is that you're putting in. So if it's not clean water that you've, you've cleaned up at your own wastewater treatment facility, you need to list out to the government what's in that water and where is it going. And you also need to monitor the water of body you're dumping into. So we've put a lot of accountability on people who used to just put things into the water willy-nilly. And that brings us to today. So we still face some water quality problems here in the Clinton River watershed, one of which is the fecal the fecal bacterial contamination that we suffer due to combined sewer overflows and septic failures. I'll get into the combined sewer overflows in a little bit and explain more in depth what that means. Um, and septic failures are when people's septic systems sort of break loose from their how they're supposed to work. So if somebody with a septic tank suddenly notices that their yard is really, really lush and green above their septic tank, that means that their septic tank is leaking. And we don't want that for our groundwater, and we don't want that for our rivers and lakes. There are still historical contaminated sediments that linger. So um, if anybody's gone on a trip in the last couple of years to the Lake St. Clair Metro Park and Metro Beach was shut down on that day, it is due to contaminated sediments of years past. Um, we're hoping to address this uh, in the coming years, two to three years to be precise. Um, we're expecting some money from the government to go in and remove those sediments, which is really good news. So hopefully sometime soon I can remove this line from our presentation. We experience flooding. Um, I live over in Macomb County, and I know when we get really, really heavy rains, some of our roads get fully inundated with water. The river breaches its banks, and it comes and it floods absolutely everywhere. And that is an issue that happens across the watershed. We have increased temperatures. Um, this is something that's also associated with a lot of people living in one place. There's a lot of paved surfaces, so they absorb heat really, really well. You can think of walking on the sidewalk in the summer, and you can feel the earth really, really warm beneath your feet. And that's a problem that we see in our waters, that the earth is distributing that thermal energy. And um, that's not great for fish or anything that lives in the water. So we want to keep temperatures cool and cold. We do have some chemicals in our water sometimes um, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, we're going to get into the biggest reason in a second, but this can be um, illicit discharges, people dumping what they absolutely should not and breaking the law. This can come from places like historical contaminations. Again, we have a lot of old um, dumps and landfills across the watershed that are monitored by the um, EPA. And some of those places have some hot spots during different times of the year where they might be off gassing or they might be um, distributing chemicals in that sort of way. But the biggest source of pollution for our watershed, as Marilyn said, is stormwater pollution. So what is stormwater pollution? This is anything that comes off of an impervious surface when water flow comes off of uh, snow melt or when it comes straight from the sky as rain. So you can imagine an impervious surface as anything that water will not pass through. This is paved roads, this is sidewalks and your roof, this is anything that water won't soak into. These pollutants are carried by stormwater directly to our drainage systems or directly to the river, and eventually they all end up in our waterways. So what are some of the pollutants that end up in stormwater? Well, we have fertilizers that come off of, um, they can come off of sidewalks or driveways when people get their lawns fertilized in the spring. If you don't sweep that back up into your grass the next time it rains, it's going to go straight into the storm drain. Sediments end up in our water because of um, 
construction so when people are constructing different um, houses or projects they have to have certain um, barriers and they have certain procedures that that they must have in order to be constructing and sometimes those things will fail they'll put netting over stormwater drains for example and when they're running their equipment back and forth across they're carrying lots of dirt and sediment with them and sometimes those nets will rip and sediments will enter the storm drain and they'll end up in our rivers and those sediments can bring pretty nasty stuff we'll, we'll talk about that a little later Oil, gas, and detergents can come off of cars. If your car is leaking oil or gas, that's one way. And the detergents actually come from washing your car. So if you wash your car in the driveway, that detergent will wash off of your car, and it doesn't just magically disappear. It actually sticks on your driveway or it runs into the road, and the next time it rains, it'll run right into the storm drains. Pet waste. Um, I hope that nobody in this room doesn't pick up after their puppy when it poops, but that is a way that we get bacterial contaminations in our waters and we see fecal coliform bacteria start to crop up. Agricultural runoff, that brings with it pesticides, um, manure, anything that people um, apply to their crops in excess, that will eventually end up into the waterways as well. And then perhaps the first and foremost is litter. When we think of stuff that gets carried into the water by rain, we think of litter. So some of the issues created by those stormwater pollutants, um, fertilizers, pet waste, and detergents all have a kind of similar issue that they lead to, which is the overgrowth of algae. So these three items contain excess nutrients that algae love, and so they'll eat up all those excess nutrients. And that causes an issue because it starts to shade out the water, so it'll prevent the vegetation on the bottom from growing properly. It can't photosynthesize. And it also causes a problem because when that algae dies off, it absorbs oxygen in the water. And we need, we need oxygen in the water for anything that breathes that water. Think fish or the bugs, anything that's living in that water. Our sediments, as I said earlier, contaminants bind to soil. So it can carry things like nutrients, like we say above, the phosphorus, the nitrates. It can also carry heavy metals and other contaminants. Um, excess sediment can also block sunlight, which limits photosynthesis of aquatic plants as well. And if you can imagine being a fish or a bug swimming around in the water, it's not very nice to breathe sandy, cloudy water. They don't really like that. Oil and gas is harmful to aquatic life, extremely harmful to aquatic life, um, but luckily we don't have a lot of problems in this watershed uh, related to that issue. And then litter, as we learn more and more about microplastics and how plastic never really goes away, uh, we see a bigger, bigger issue emerge with our aquatic life that associate in these habitats that have urban influences. When plastic comes into these urban waterways, it gets broken down in the water, and that means that microplastics are being associated with our fish and our bugs and our plants. So microplastics in the Great Lakes, this isn't a very fun fact, but plastic debris makes up about 80% of the litter on the Great Lakes shorelines, and nearly 22 million pounds enter the Great Lakes each and every year. Those are some pretty startling numbers. And unfortunately, that plastic breaks down and it becomes a smaller plastic called microplastics. So microplastics can come from a primary source. Um, a couple years back, there was a lot of media coverage about um, body washes and face washes that contained microplastic beads and legislation asking that they be banned. Um, so there are microplastics that are made on purpose that can end up in water. They also can be shed or broken off of larger pieces of plastic debris. So whenever you see a water bottle sitting on the side of the road, that's, end up, that's going to eventually end up in the river and it's gonna break down into microplastics because the river's gonna mechanically break it down. It can also come from other sources. Um, I wasn't very pleased to find this out, but it can be shed from textiles such as um, waterproof jackets, polyester sweaters, um, things that are made out of plastic that you might not realize. They break down in your washing machine because your washing machine is built to agitate your clothes and get the dirt out of them. It also causes those things to shed fibers and that ends up in the water. Microplastics have been found in our food, in the water, and in the air we breathe. Um, about a month ago, a paper came across my desk that they had discovered nanoplastics in human blood 
and it's it's really shocking to hear those to hear those things and to hear how prevalent it is in our ecosystems and in our world. They can then degrade into nanoplastics, which, as I said, can be discovered in blood. They've been discovered as far as Antarctica in the krill and amphipods that live over there. Um, they have the ability to break down microplastics into even smaller nanoplastics that they find in their tissues. And nanoplastics are in fact so small that they can diffuse through the membranes of your cells and they can um, start to denature the proteins there. So nanoplastics are, are no joke. There's a little resource at the bottom here. EarthHero.com is a, a little resource that we found just recently. So I, I can't say I'm endorsing it, but it seems like a cool, a cool website to visit for low waste and plastic free items. So taking a deeper dive into stormwater, our wastewater that comes off of our sinks and toilets, our washing machines, our showers, those go to our sewer systems. Those go to a wastewater treatment plant and then they can send that water back to you and it can be reused. Our stormwater goes to a storm sewer system. So the stuff that comes off of the impervious surfaces will run into the storm drain, and all of that goes directly into streams, rivers, and ponds completely untreated. These do not go to a plant. So whatever comes off of the roads goes into our rivers and ponds and lakes. In some parts of our watershed, we still have some combined sewer systems. So this picture on the right is the easiest way to explain how that works. In separate systems, we have the storm sewer and we have the, s the sewer system from our septics, from our, um, our wastewater. And when we have heavy rains, the storm water sewer gets overflowed and our um, sewage system is completely unaffected. In a combined sewer system, those two are specially built so that they will combine so that you can treat this water. Everything that comes off will be sent to a plant and it will be treated. But when you have heavy, heavy rainfall, these sewers get overwhelmed and that means that only part of it gets sent to the sewage treatment plant and some of it will actually overflow into a local water body. This is a um, much older way of uh, building a city and we only have a couple of these events every year. These are actually reported. Um, it's public information available on combined sewer overflow events. The cities that have combined sewer systems have to report those numbers and they need to know exactly how much has been overflowed, what's going where. They have to report those things to the government. So it's something that's highly regulated and highly monitored, but it is something that goes on in our watershed. Places like Royal Oak, places that have been heavily, heavily urbanized and have been around for a really long time. So now let's think about rainfall on natural surfaces. We're talking a lot about urban issues and what happens in a watershed that's got a lot of impervious surfaces. What happens out in nature? What's the natural way that water moves through a system? So natural surfaces make good use of rainwater and snow melt. One mature tree can absorb over 4,000 gallons of stormwater each year. And as water percolates through the soil, groundwater is recharged. This is the natural way that things move through the ecosystem. This is our natural water cycle. The Clinton River watershed has more than 1.5 million people in its, its very small area, and sustaining this population requires impervious surfaces for our transportation, for people to work, live. But our roads, homes, and businesses don't leave much room for natural surfaces. Um, I wish my backyard looked like this, but it doesn't. Impervious surfaces also speed up the process of water reaching rivers, lakes, and streams. Large inputs of water in a short period of time can cause flooding and erosion. So this is a picture that was taken in 2018 when we had an enormous, enormous flooding event. Um, a lot of rain coming down at once in a place with a lot of impervious surfaces. All that stuff goes directly to the river and there's not a lot of natural surfaces that can intercept it and stop it from getting there. So the two issues are of quantity and quality of stormwater. The quantity of stormwater entering our rivers, lakes, and streams, as well as the pollutants that come through, the water quality, and degrade aquatic habitat and water quality. 
So what can we do to improve stormwater quality and quantity? When we let nature function uninterrupted. I'm going to read this quote, so bear with me. <laughs> the water from a two-inch downpour, more than 54,000 gallons per acre, is captured almost entirely by an oak forest's leaf litter and the organic humus it creates. Litter and humus don't hold this water indefinitely, but they do corral it on site just long enough for it to seep into the ground, replenishing the water table on which so, mani so many of us depend. In areas with no leaf litter, that same two-inch rainstorm causes a flood. This is from The Nature of Oaks by Dr. Doug Tallamy. So leaf litter promotes infiltration, as he said. But in an urban setting, leaf litter promotes phosphorus and nitrates into our stormwater. And in, a, in an incredibly urban setting, it can end up st clogging our storm drains and causing a flooding problem. So leaf litter is just one example of how an urban setting changes the dynamic of natural processes. Leaf litter is supposed to be a good thing. It's supposed to intercept water and make a difference with our storm water. But in an urban setting, it can actually have the opposite effect. So one of the solutions to this, one of the ways that um, city planners and watershed planners are trying to uh, combine the urban and the natural is through green infrastructure or green stormwater infrastructure. Green infrastructure imitates the natural systems in order to capture, soak up, filter, and store water. Its aim is to reduce stormwater surges as well as the amount of pollutants entering our waterways. So some examples of green infrastructure. We have a green roof on the right here. Um, that's a garden or any kind of green space created on the roof of a building that'll intercept the, the storm water right as it's falling. It'll soak up here and it can, it can be absorbed by those plants and taken up naturally. There are rain barrels which you can direct to your down, you can connect to your downspouts and absorb all the water that would normally just run through your gutters and run into your yard. And you can then use that water to water your plants, water your lawn, and you get use out of that water that would normally run right off your roof and just run into the waterways. Rain gardens are also an excellent way to do that. Rain gardens, um, you can pick an area in your yard that already naturally collects water. If you have a place in your yard that's a natural low spot, that when you walk in there after a rain, it sort of squidges under your feet, that's a perfect place for a rain garden or you can construct one to capture the flow that comes off of your downspout. So you can direct that water to a rain garden. And I've got a diagram a little later to get into the more uh, complicated aspect of the rain garden. But next up is the permeable paper pavers, which we have a picture of on the top here. This is the regular masonry. And then in between those spaces, you've got some kind of like moss or grass or vegetation. So about half of the water that would normally just run off of a driveway or a sidewalk or a street can then be absorbed by a plant. An urban tree canopy is an excellent way to intercept water. Um, something that I didn't mention before is that when rain falls on an oak forest, it also gets intercepted by the leaves. Um, trees and plants have a natural cuticle layer that is um, water intolerant, so it'll beat up and it'll roll off the leaf, but a lot of times they will capture that water and it'll just stay on the leaf. And so then over time as the sun comes out and as the day gets started, it'll evaporate off those leaves instead of just falling on the ground and, and rushing off to be storm water. So having an urban tree canopy is an excellent way to intercept some of that storm water as well. Uh, Bioswales, uh, I find, are best described as fancy ditches. Um, they're meant to hold on to a lot of water, but they also have native plants and um, native shrubs and grasses in order to help absorb that water. So it's not just sitting in a ditch like you would normally see when you're driving down the road. And then the last thing here is our planter boxes. So this person has directed their downspout directly into some plants that can absorb that water. Native plants and trees specifically play a huge role in green stormwater infrastructure. Water can move across the land as runoff, while some water infiltrates the soil, percolating downwards and moving horizontally to a nearby water source. So not only can they intercept that water on its leaves, they can also help that water to absorb into the soil and recharge the water table, as well as slowly make its way back to the nearby water source. So this is a really neat picture. This gentleman here is standing next to a native prairie plant that has been pulled up and its roots are intact. 
So these native plants have really, really long, complicated root systems, and they help to absorb excess nutrients and contaminants from the soil before they reach a water source. This is one of my favorite pictures that we show at these presentations. So on the far left here, we have Kentucky bluegrass. This is a really, really common grass that people plant as their lawn. And this is the length of the grass and the length of the roots. When you compare that to our native prairie species, these grass roots are pathetic. They, can, they can't even get past the length of the grass itself. Whereas we have these prairie plants that are reaching upwards of 15 feet into the soil layer. And when you have these complex and deep root systems, that allows water to get in between those soil spaces and penetrate deeper into the earth so that they can recharge that groundwater. In addition to that, these plants are really, really well suited for Michigan climates. They can handle tough droughts because their roots are so deep reaching, they can, they can reach that moisture layer. And they can also put up with a lot of water because they absorb a lot of water. Native plants are capable of phytoremediation. Phyto is a Latin prefix that's meaning um, plant or related to plants. And remediation is the process of making something better, fixing something that's been dirtied or polluted. Um, where contaminants are taken up from the soil and sequestered in leaves or stabilized within the roots of these native plants. This is accomplished with help from microorganisms in the rhizosphere. So this picture is showing our rhizosphere here. So the rhizosphere is this area at the tips of the roots and all of our native plants have these beneficial organisms that are associated with the roots. They help them to metabolize nutrients, they help them to break down things that occur naturally in the soil, and they help them to absorb those nutrients and better use them. So these microorganisms let our native plants do some pretty remarkable stuff. They can deal with these contaminants in a couple different ways depending on the plant, and some plants can do a combination of these, some plants can do one or the other, um, but each of these are a way that these contaminants can be dealt with within a native plant. So the phytodegradation at the top here, that is when a plant will uptake a contaminant, and then in some part of its body, it has its body, I'm sorry, I'm over here uh, uh, comparing plants to people. In, in a part of the plant, it will then be able to degrade that that chemical or that contaminant into a different substance that won't be toxic to the plant. They can turn that con contaminant into a volatile that will off-gas out and it'll become something that can be put into the atmosphere. Um, research on that is a little bit, it's, it's up and coming, um, but that's a way that plants can take up a contaminant and move it out of the soil. The phyto extraction is when a plant will uptake a contaminant and then sequester it to a part of its structure and then lose that structure. So this plant can take up those contaminants, shove it all in one leaf, and then it'll drop that leaf. So it'll take it out of that soil, which is the important part. You might be thinking it's taking up that contaminant and it's just putting it somewhere else. But the important part is to get it out of the soil so that the plants can continue to thrive. They can also stabilize and stimulate these contaminants. So the roots themselves and the microorganisms associated with them can stabilize that contaminant and turn it into something that isn't toxic and is inert in the soil, or it can break it down like it can in its other um, parts. So some of the, th I'm, I'm gonna get nerdy for a minute and talk about some of the more um, in-depth look at this phytoremediation that they're capable of. So these, these two guys here, our cottonwoods and our willows, are some of the most common trees used for phytoremediation of organic and inorganic contaminants. Um, down here, our purple coneflower, which our other two studies are referencing, uh, they have the ability to reduce the total petroleum hydrocarbons, which is something associated with gasoline, by almost half after just a 30-day period within an experimental setting. In an additional study, these contaminants found in the purple coneflower plant material increased from year one to year two of the study. So they actually have the ability to continue this process through time. It's not a one and done thing. They can continue to remediate that soil over time as, as they go through their lives. This is a lot of words, so bear with me. <laughs> there was a study performed at a, formal a former steel mill with contaminated soil 
Um, it was contaminated with PAHs, which is another hydrocarbon um, associated with gasoline and oils. Um, these PAH degrading bacteria are naturally found in the soil, but they were found to be greatest in the plots that were planted versus plots that did not have any plants. Uh, the plants used, I am so bad with Latin, so I'm just going to tell you what the common names of these plants were. They used common bone set, they had New England aster, they had um, big blue stem and dark green bulrush, and it was found that the PAH contamination in the vegetated plots was effectively remediated compared to the non-vegetated soils. So this bacteria, these microbial species that can break down these gasoline compounds, they were found to exist more readily. They preferred the soil with these plants because they have a sort of mutualistic relationship. So when we plant these things in our, in our contaminated plots in our restoration projects at our remediation sites, we can actually attract these beneficial bacteria just by having native plants there. The deep growing roots of native plants also provide erosion control. So this is a project that CRWC got to be involved with over at Depot Park in Clarkston. On the bottom left here is what the bank looked like before we had native plants. So there's a lot of bank failure down here. It just looked really nasty looking. They were trying to mow the lawn straight down to the river and it just wasn't working. Then we got volunteers together and we got to plant some natives in. This is three years later when all these plants were well established. And it's amazing the difference that it's made. We no longer see those bank failures because these plants are holding in that soil and they're holding up those banks. So what can you do to protect water quality? Well, the good news is we can all help. The responsibility of keeping our waterways clean does not fall on any one entity or individual, and it never does. You know, It's more than one entity or individual that's created these problems, and it's going to take more than one person to fix it. We've got 1.5 million people in the watershed, and that is thousands and thousands of storm drains. So if we each do our part, we can make a huge difference over time across the watershed. Here's some quick tips. Uh, my, my biggest, it's like a personal pet peeve of mine, so I'm going to try not to get out on a tangent here, but flushing wipes down the toilet, there is no such thing as a flushable wipe, and it causes a lot of problems for our wastewater treatment plants. They have to, on a very regular basis, go into their cleaning tanks and remove these wipes physically and send them off to the landfill. So if we can avoid flushing wipes, it makes a huge difference because they're not wasting resources and time to clean up that problem. I wish I would have brought mine, but there are laundry bags and laundry balls. There's, there's all kinds of technology these days that you can throw in your washing machine if you're washing something with synthetic fibers, and it will actually catch those microplastics as they shed off of your clothes. So my laundry bag, for example, I throw, I have a sweater, unfortunately, that is made of polyester, and I would rather hold on to it than throw it away and I throw it in my laundry bag in with the rest of my laundry and over time it's collected these very very small fibers on the inside of the bag right up near the zipper so it's really easy for me to pick those out and throw them in the trash. You can wash your car at a car wash or on the grass as I mentioned earlier when you wash your car in your um, front driveway or out in the street that detergent's going to get washed off and then it's just going to end up on that impervious surface and get caught up the next time it rains. So when you take it to a car wash they are specially equipped to recycle that water and they have a special system to collect it and send it to the sewers so it doesn't go to the storm drains. It also saves water because they're very, very efficient with their water usage. They're built to wash cars, and so they use very, very little to do so. Keeping your lawn tools and cars in good working order so gas and oil aren't leaking from them. This is uh, snow blowers and weed whippers and anything that's gas powered. If you, if you keep up on it and make sure it's not leaking, you're keeping petroleum out of the water. You can plant natives. I can't talk enough about how awesome native plants are. Native plants are native to Michigan and they are best equipped to live in Michigan. They can handle our climate, they can handle drought, they can handle floods, they can remediate the soil, they can hold in the banks, 
and they can help water to absorb better into the soil. There's just a million things that native plants can do for us and they benefit the local wildlife as well. Native plants attract native pollinators. So that's the five Bs, birds, bees, butterflies, bats, and beetles. And who doesn't want a bird watch in your backyard? If you, if you use fertilizer, you want to use the minimum amount that you could possibly need. So there are lawn care services that offer low or no phosphorus fertilizer and slow release nitrogen fertilizer. Or if you, if you can get away with it, use no fertilizer. That way you're keeping the excess nutrients out of the water and you're keeping that algae away from our waters. It's not going to bloom out of control. Direct downspouts in your yard to a rain garden or a rain barrel instead of to the cement. So we can talk about rain gardens now, finally. Rain gardens, rain gardens. So rain gardens are a, um, a special kind of green stormwater infrastructure that is created and designed specifically with the purpose to collect stormwater runoff so that it can percolate and absorb slowly into the ground as well as be absorbed by the plants. So in this picture here, we have these plants that are sort of in this, this divot in the soil, and that way it can collect the water coming off of this downspout, and it can slowly percolate into the soil and be absorbed by these plants. The key to having a functioning rain garden is to put it in a place that either naturally collects the water or to direct a downspout to that place. So it needs to be in a wet spot of your yard. It also needs to have first a layer of plants and below that it needs to have a coarse layer of material. If it's sand or gravel or small cobbles, you don't want that water to just stagnate and stick in the rain garden. It wants to absorb into the groundwater. That's the goal of the rain garden. So you have to have something that it can travel through. A lot of people in our watershed have um, clay layers in their backyards. So for them to have a rain garden, they got to do a little bit more work digging so they can get to a deeper layer and then put down that gravel or that sand so that the plants can be the first line of defense and then it can reach through to that coarse layer of sediment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, dirt, um, compost, or um, you can also, in addition to that, mulch on top if, you, if that's your preference. Um, as long as there's not a storm drain that's coming off of that rain garden that the mulch might like run into. But it's, yeah, it's completely up to you. So lastly, and I, I wanted to wrap up a little early in case anybody else had any questions, but feel free to, to jump in any time. So what is the CRWC doing to manage stormwater? Well, for one, we do public education um, opportunities such as these where we go out and we talk to folks like you guys about stormwater and its effects and what you can do to prevent um, more stormwater and what you can do to improve the quality of that water. Uh, we also do K through 12 education through our stream leaders program and other events um, where we talk to kids about the importance of water quality and students about what they can do at home to improve water quality. Um, we have newsletters. Our website is a fantastic resource. Um, we also have available guidebooks and river outings. Um, we have a pretty cool library at our office. So if you're ever looking to head to the southwest, the southwest corner of Avon and Livernois. You can come by and check out some of our books. Um, we also have river outings, as I said. Um, our stewardship programs. Uh, we had 60 cleanup events over the last year, and over 8,000 pounds of trash was removed from the river in 2021. We have a variety of these stewardship programs, so on a weekly basis, we get out in the watershed and we do cleanups from 10 to noon. Um, we have opportunities to get folks into canoes and kayaks on the river throughout the summer months um, to pick up. We find all sorts of like construction cones and tires and we pull all sorts of plastic out of the river um, and that's a really really cool opportunity I, I highly encourage anybody who likes to paddle to come out to one of our trash runs and give it a go we also have citizen science initiatives um, we have our adopt a stream program where folks go out on the river and they actually get to participate in water quality monitoring so they do a bug survey where they check out the macro invertebrates that swim around in the water they do a physical survey so they see what the flows are like in that area and they also do a survey for invasive species while they're out there um, 
and then they report back to us. And so we get to kind of keep the pulse on the river because we have a staff of just eight full-time people and it's hard to cover a big service area like the Clinton River watershed. So we love engaging our citizen scientists to help us keep an eye on things. Yeah, so we just wrapped up all of our trainings for the spring. We do that monitoring the Adopt-A-Stream. We do that in the spring and in the fall, the first weekend of May and October. So we just wrapped up our last training, but we train our volunteers, and then we also have team leaders that have been in the program for at minimum a year before they can become a, a leader, and they help lead the volunteers. We on one weekend, we send them all out and then they all report to us and drop their equipment back off. But it's a really cool opportunity. I wish I could say we have a training coming up, but we just wrapped up. So that's happening again in September. We'll have more trainings to offer. And we do those across the watershed. We make an effort to have a training in each of our sub watersheds. So there's gonna be opportunities no matter where you live. You guys are lucky because you're right down the road from our office. So we have a training in Rochester Hills in the spring and the fall. And then with our watershed management, we do stream bank restorations. Um, we help folks to plan rain gardens and we also um, sometimes have the opportunity to help folks plant their rain gardens. Um, we help out with river access planning. We have a program called Water Towns where we work with municipalities to um, help river access. And we've been able to install a couple um, universally accessible kayak launches around the Clinton River. Um, we provide technical assistance to those local governments and landowners um, regarding large woody debris. Um, we help advise them on what kind of plants they should plant in and around the river, uh, what they can do if they see bank failures, um, and we try to help as best we can with invasive plants. But if we don't have the answer to something, we're also an excellent resource for who you should get in contact with. So for example, we have folks um, ask us about invasive species that are um, like a large scale issue that maybe we can't come out and take care of. So we can direct them to the Lake St. Clair County SISMA, or we can direct them to the Oakland County SISMA, and those folks can help actually get out there and do their job to remove those invasive species. Um, we also do monitoring of those restoration projects. So each year we go through all of the restoration projects that have happened across the watershed. We return to those year after year to collect data and see how they're doing. We don't just say, hey, we, we put in this restoration project, sounds good, hope it does its job, and then leave it to, to do its thing. We go back to it year after year. We say, okay, this part of it might be failing. This might be something to revisit. Okay, these numbers aren't looking exactly what we were expecting expecting them to, what can we do to fix that, who can, we, who can we get in touch with to get the funds to fix that, that sort of thing. And on an individual basis, you can get involved with us and protect your water a number of ways. So you can educate your friends, family, and coworkers about what you learned today. You can um, consider some native landscaping and green infrastructure, perhaps in your own backyard. You could put a rain garden. You can become a citizen scientist with our Adopt-A-Stream program. You can volunteer at CRW Say Cleanups. Um, we're also going to have an opportunity um, for folks to help us plant a garden in our, in our front of our office. We got a grant from the Wildflower Association of Michigan to put a pollinator garden out front. And we're going to need volunteers to help us pull out all the plants and get all the mulch going and put all the plant plugs in. So if anybody's interested in getting their hands dirty with some plants, we'll be needing you for that. Uh, we also have our River Safe Lake Safe self certification program. So, River Safe Lake Safe is um, best described as a survey that you can take where you check all the boxes of the watershed friendly um, lifestyle habits you have. So, it'll have questions like, Do you take your car to a car wash? It'll have questions like, Do you fertilize your lawn? Have you considered planting a rain garden? If um, you live right next to a water body, we're going to ask, do you mow straight up to the edge there or do you leave a buffer of plants? Um, if you have a boat, do you decontaminate your boat when you leave one water body to another to prevent the spread of invasive species? And I want to say it's about 27 questions. And if you answer each one in accordance, we send you a neat little plaque, this little river safe, lake safe plaque, and you are a certified river safe, lake safe property. And it's also just a good um, 
a good way to kind of check yourself. If you think, well, I'm, I, I don't know, I think I could be doing more to be watershed friendly. You can go through the survey and you can say, well, I might, I might need to do something like that. I mean, I might need to not mow all the way to the edge of my property. Maybe I should leave some plants to grow in and be natural. So with that, I'm happy to talk to any of y'all about any kind of questions you have. If you want to talk rain gardens, I love talking about native plants. I would love to chat with you guys. Yeah. Well, come on over. <laughs> What's your question? Um, all right, my question is that um, we moved here to Rochester Hills um, and found that HOA has a lot of stipulation about what to be placed in the front yard. And there, uh, for, for our particular HOA, the kind of uh, very shallow root grass was exactly what was stipulated. And we really wanted to do our front yard to be more um, natural and native plants. But I don't really know if you could recommend an approach to convince the existing HOA to change some of their rules. Um, just need some advice on that. Yeah, yeah. So I just moved out of my parents' place, and now I'm living in an apartment. But their HOA was very strict. You need to have Kentucky bluegrass in your yard. This is what you have. This is that. That's it. They drew the line, you know. Um, so in cases like that where you can't have a full native yard, we would highly recommend a garden because if you're allowed to have any leeway with your landscaping in any way, there are lots of low profile native plants that they wouldn't know the difference between something that you got at the greenhouse and this native plant species. In terms of um, convincing, it can be a difficult thing, but if you, I mean, we're happy to advocate for you. If you want us on your side, we're happy to sit down and talk about the benefits of native plants, as well as the benefits of low profile native plants and stuff that can be, it can look very manicured and ve very well taken care of. And there's lots of native plants um, that you, you really wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a, a mowed lawn and, and letting them run wild, so to speak. Um, but we haven't had much luck with uh, folks trying to like write new rules or like edit the bylaws and stuff like that. Some HOA people, I mean, I, I hope nobody here is a president of an HOA, but they're not my favorite people in the world, I'll say that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Two things. I did um, get to talk to uh, at the uh, an HOA conference at the Rochester Hills, and I introduced um, native plants as saying, "Are you uh, getting flooding? Are you seeing erosion? Are is your detention pond not working as well?" And so we have a couple of HOAs. One of them, Chris is, uh, uh, Bobrick, who is, uh, works for the Clinton River Watershed Council, a president of an HOA, contacted um, me uh, because he was at that conference. And they are looking at planting some native plants in their common areas. Another person um, of a, a, on Adams Road, there's an HOA. And they're starting. And he heard, our, our, uh, present, he heard my presentation. And he's going to see if he can get some in their entrances. So it, there, we're, we're making headway. Uh, with that, and with that, and they were asking for case studies. So as soon as we get one, we're going to start um, spreading the word even more because what's happening in these backyards is they're getting spongy because they're because of that strict ruling of the grass of the grass. But it, you know, it could be that you could ask, um, you know, for somebody even call um, Parks and Rec over at um, if you're in Rochester Hills. And start asking these questions because more and more people are, and the more people that start getting more organized or getting enough grassroots, they're making some changes. And um, Kaylee was right, was that there are certain plants that are home garden friendly, that they're, they're beautiful. And unfortunately, some of them are called weeds, but they don't look like weeds. So that's, that's what's happening now. Yeah, they could, they're integrating these native plants and they don't look like weeds.
Yeah, so, so I guess like long story short, you can absolutely get in touch with us and we would be happy to help facilitate that and advocate for native plants in your HOA. We would love to do that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that I was not, I was on my board for a while. I'm not now, but they're people like you and me. So to be afraid of them, I understand because they can be intimidating, but we're just trying to solve problems on a budget and we need information. So if you guys are able to come and talk to people, I think that's an excellent solution because we have problems that we don't know how to solve. We don't know where to start. And there's a lot of water around here. Yeah. So. Exactly. Exactly. And everybody's dealing with water and everybody's afraid because we've had big floods and anybody who's near the creeks or on the r rivers or anywhere nearby, we all, we're all scared and getting phone calls and having to manage it. So anything we can do to do that, I think people are, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask a question. Um, we did a paving project last year, so we put asphalt down and they used that netting that you were talking about in the storm drains and as soon as we were done with the paving project we had a huge rain it was one of those big rains that we had last summer and so we, we it, the parking lot flooded and it was going into people's homes and all of that because probably whatever front left over from the project got washed into the storm drains and it was collecting and it, they were not draining so guess what we did people got out there in their trucks and their boots and they poked holes in the filter <laughs> to let all that stuff into the system. But that was in a panic. Nobody knew what had happened, what had caused it. All we saw was we had fresh paving and now we've got a flood and now we're angry and upset and worried and all of that. So I really appreciate you taking the time to educate uh, people, but I think there's a lot of work to do. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree. I completely I agree. agree. Yeah, absolutely. And tomorrow I'll be there. We're, we've just got the, the 10 minutes, so we're going to talk yeah. about detention ponds. And well, they only gave me three, and I took five. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. And if anybody um, has any kind of opportunity where they'd like us to come out and speak, we are absolutely, absolutely happy to do that. We really want to spread the word on these things and help educate people to make better decisions and to. Um, take into account the bigger picture, you know, because when, when the construction workers come in and lay down that netting and then they get out of there, they don't take care of that. They don't wrap that up and, and get the storm drains working again when they leave. And that's a problem. And, that's, and it's, on, it's on all of us to try and educate each other. <laughs> but us especially, we love educating. So any, anything that anybody wants us to come and speak at, we are absolutely happy to. Yeah. For a rain garden, I was thinking I have two places in my home where it gets um, it gets puddle and and an ice cream when it freezes, but it's not really like in a depression because my backyard goes down and it puddles there in the backyard, and then the front it puddles in the in the at the, at the top of the hill and then it goes down again. Can I just like make a hole so that it collects there, like me manually make a hole even if it's not like that? And if also another question before, the, and like how far from the from the house? Because my husband he was a little nervous, like it's too close to the house, and he'll be um, concerned about the water going down that way. Absolutely. So we recommend that folks try to keep it at least 20 feet away from their foundation. We want to be at least 20 feet away from the house. Um, and then in terms of your question of you don't have a really good pre-existing depression in the yard you can absolutely dig one out and make it a little bit deeper but you you can also have something that's less of a formal rain garden and more of just a, a native garden that helps to absorb that water yeah absolutely absolutely and if you are dealing with something like clay where you're worried um yeah if it if it's sandy that's awesome because that means that it'll it'll drain a little bit better once you have some plant roots in there to to get some space in between the soil and the sand. Um, but you can have an informal rain garden. It doesn't need to be 
um, crazy planned out. It works better when you plan it out and if you can dig that big hole. But if you can't, any any native plant in any capacity does a, a better job than just just turf grass. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, or also if um, this is this is a question for like HOAs as well, but. Um, most places allow like rain rain barrels so you can have a rain barrel be directly attached to your downspout or you can have a planter that the downspout empties out into and that'll reduce the water in your yard you'll still have some water there but you can kind of direct it away from those areas and into a collection like that yeah absolutely and anybody that has any kind of questions that you want to follow up with please reach out to me because i'm happy to help you plan plan a native garden or help you get in touch with people that can get you some native plants. How do you find out if it's been harvested properly? I've looked at your website and I couldn't find a link. There is a link for volunteers that mm -hmm. Yeah, so for the citizen scientist for our adopt -a stream program, the first step is to sign up for one of the trainings. So um, we have on our events tab and also on our Facebook, um, we keep a, a, a running, um, on our events tab especially, we keep like a running go of everything that we have planned out. So if you sign up for the training, at that training, Eric, our watershed ecologist, can talk to you about where do you want to monitor, what team do you want to be on. Um, but the training is the first step. Um, and in terms of like a formal sign up, you can email Eric, but there's no formal sign up that usually takes place at the training. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Are there any places like cities where rain barrels are not permitted? I'd heard a few years ago on the radio, like on Science Friday or something, that it was, so it was a national program, that some cities had jurisdictions like the water that ran off your roof didn't belong to you. You weren't allowed to collect it. Yeah. So I can understand about HOAs, but I heard that for cities. You don't know of anything like that? I haven't, I certainly haven't heard of it in our watershed specifically, and if there is a community in our watershed that has that kind of um, rule or any kind of like jurisdiction over your roof water, we certainly don't know anything about it. So I, I want to tentatively, like 98%, I want to say that's, that's not a problem in our watershed. Yeah. Yeah. And we have, we live in a community with a HOA, and... Um, several of us have rain barrels, and it's never been an issue, and we just direct it where we want to. Uh, and, in fact, I think at your facility, they were actually selling them one year. They're That's where we... Again. Oh, are you? Okay. You, uh, you can get in a plug. Absolutely, yeah. Our rain barrel sale's going on right now, and pickup is going to be later on in the month of May. So we've got a flyer on our website. Oh, what's the easiest way to get to it? I want to say our Facebook is probably the easiest way to find our flyer, but we're doing the sale through Michigan Rain Barrel, MI Rain Barrel, and um, then we're going to have a workshop at our office where you can come and pick it up. Ooh, I, it is it is May. I'm going to give you the exact date because I have it, but I want to I got to pull it up. Yeah, so the rain barrels, those are a much easier sell on people because that's not like landscaping. That's not something that's going to draw attention to your house or like anything anything crazy that they might have a problem with. Yeah, that, that might scare someone. Let's see. It is May 21st is the day that people are going to be picking up their rain barrels and we're going to have a workshop as well um, on how to like DIY a rain barrel. Michigan Rain Barrels partnering with us to put on the workshop and everything so it's going to be neat. Anybody else? Yeah. Springfield? Spring, Springfield Township. So we're trying to determine if she's Clinton Watershed or Flint River. Ooh, yeah, that's like right on the edge. I would have to pull up um, our watershed map because so it starts to get really, and I want to say um, 
regardless of if you're officially Flint River Watershed or if you're Clinton River Watershed, we are absolutely happy to help you with any questions. You can call us up and we can we can determine if, if you know you're right on the edge or whatever but we can still help you with any questions you have about water quality or, or rain gar rain barrels or rain gardens or anything of that nature oh yeah that's no good and and rain gardens can definitely help with that so yeah we're we're happy to help even if you're outside the watershed we would love to be a resource yeah, absolutely. And if anybody has anything they, that comes to mind later, feel free to reach out to me directly, or you can reach out to contact at CRWC as well. Um, you can also give the office a call. If I'm not in the office, my voicemail is available, and I will get back to you. But um, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. You guys were such a lovely crowd. Thank you. Thank you.